All right, well, the problem that is beneath the scene, beneath the text, and yet it ties the whole thing together, is this ongoing tension between what's called Israel, referring to the 10 tribes, and Judah, that is the tribe that it belongs to David. You know that there was always a little bit of hostility between Judah and the rest, so much so that years later the two would actually split into two kingdoms in a civil conflict that would never be resolved. But right now that fault line is already at work, and so we need to keep our eye on that ball as we look through this text because there will be a careful distinction being made between Israel, referring to those ten tribes, and Judah, referring to the one. And so you'll notice here, what we discover is that Israel seems to be stepping up first and beginning to talk about how we're going to bring David back. After all, he is a national hero. For Pete's sake, he was the one that saved us from the Philistines. What, did we, what were we doing? What were we thinking when we anointed? It's kind of a moment when they're coming back to their senses after this strange departure from their loyalty. And so they're trying to figure it out. And of course, in this process, David is simply staying put. Until he's really invited back, he's not going to presume to go back. And so at least at this point, he's playing this uh, in a fairly respectable way. Now, Israel is trying to figure out how to do it, but you get the feeling kind of at a subtle level in this text that there is this kind of recrimination going on. They're just a little bit twisted up around this whole problem. How do we do it? They're feeling somewhat embarrassed. They want to extend the invitation, yet there's this blaming each other that's going on. And so all of this is more or less causing them to delay. And that's the critical part of what's happening here. A little bit of delay while David is cooling his heels there in Mahanaim. So, David is a little concerned about this, again, if we read between the lines. He doesn't want to leave the top spot vacant for too long, because that won't be good for the kingdom, let alone for him. And so, in a sense, he wants to grease the skids a little bit, try to open the doors for his return without being too pushy about it. He wants to try to figure out how to do this. So, King David sent to Zadok and Abiathar the priests, saying, speak to the elders of Judah and ask them, why are you the last to bring the king back to his home? Since the words of all Israel have come to the king to his very house. Now the ticklish problem that Judah had was number one, they were David's home tribe, which would you think naturally make them loyal to David, but Absalom had actually built his rebellion based on people from Judah. Remember when Absalom left Jerusalem, he went to Hebron, which is the capital of Judah. And there he was able to rally sufficient forces to actually march on Jerusalem against David, running him out of town. So Ju Judah's a little nervous. They have got egg on their face big time. They don't know how David's gonna respond. They don't know if he's ever going to speak to them again. And so while the Israel, who on the face of it has less claim to, Jew, uh, to David, is making a play for trying to call David back, Judah, who should have been first in line, is conspicuously absent from the conversation. You kind of see what's going on here. And so David sends to his inside men in Jerusalem. Zadok and Abiathar are priests. David had planted them in Jerusalem to be a source of intel to David when Absalom was running the shop there to provide him that inside information, and they're still there. So they're still on his payroll, and they're still doing his service, and so he sends a word to them wanting to get them to facilitate the return. So he sort of sends this little kind of biting criticism, how come you guys are the last? to be inviting me to come back and be the king once again. Go speak to the elders of Judah. Well, there's a message being telegraphed here. 
If David is going to send Zadok and Abiathar, the priests, to the elders of Judah, then in a sense it's a message to the people of Judah that David isn't holding any grudges and that he wants them to play the role that they have in the past and invite him back. And so in a sense, this is going to be good news for them. A little bit of relief that David isn't going to hold this against them long term. And so in a sense, we hear that going on as the story unfolds. They'd been fearful of David's response, possible reprisals, but now, of course, David is in a sense setting aside that particular concern and really inviting them to step to the front of the line and invite David to come back. Now, David is hoping, I think, at this point, and he's, he's being a politician, and he knows he's got two political forces, factions out there, and he's trying to manage them, and he realizes that the ten tribes now are, in a sense, in a slightly better position than Judah, and so he's just trying to equalize it. He's just trying to invite Judah to the party, you know, get them back into the conversation, but in a sense, they're going to go beyond his expectations and create their own set of problems, as we'll see in a moment. So David continues in this appeal to his native tribesmen. You are my brethren, you are my bone and my flesh. Why then are you the last ones to invite me back? I've been hearing from everybody else. Nothing from you guys, you see. So kind of the old axiom, blood is thicker than water. David's hoping a little blood in this commonality that he shares with them will pay off. Now, so far, so good. David is still not at his best. We've seen, if you've been in the class, you know that there's been a lot of missteps. Ever since the Bathsheba incident, David has been a little bit off his balance. He's tried to claw back, and he's certainly made some progress, but we don't see quite the clarity of ethical understanding and principle that had dominated David's career earlier. Things just got a little bit fragmented, and now we see some more evidence of that. Say to Amasa, are you not bone of uh, my bone and my flesh? And then David, uh, David takes an oath, God do so to me and more also if you are not commander of the army before me continually in the place of Joab. Well again, if you've been in the class, you know who Amasa is. He's a nephew of David, that in itself would probably be good, but Amasa is also the one who sided with Absalom, who led the armies opposed to David, who led the revolting military against David. He's been the colossal bad guy, second only to Absalom himself, in this recently defeated coup. And so for David to turn around and offer command of all of the armies of Israel, all of the armies of Judah, the whole military establishment in that region to Amasaw was unexpected to say the least, you see. Not exactly what you would have thought would take place. Now, if you look at it in the light most favorable to David, then you might say David is hoping to ingratiate back to himself those forces that had fought under Amasa, because this is a known commander and so they might be more likely to trust him and follow him back to the fold if they have this familiar face out in front okay so far so good but probably dominating David's agenda here a little bit more profoundly is his absolute resentment and anger at Joab, right? Because Joab has always been a problem. He's been brilliant, he is brilliant, he's been doggedly loyal to David, but sometimes he just goes a little bit beyond what is what David would have authorized and he's created some problems. So you recall way back when Joab killed Abner that was way back months ago. David barely got past that. Now Joab did do David's dirty work in connection with Uriah and that story of Bathsheba and Uriah, you recall. 
But when David had given an explicit order, treat Absalom gently, even though he's trying to kill me, don't do that to him. Joab heard it, and Joab, fully aware of David's command, nevertheless put a spear right through the man's heart, you see. And David was just not about to forgive that crime. And so this is partly a way to win back those who had been part of the rebellious movement against him, but probably much more, it's just a way to slap Joab in the face. He can't kill Joab. He's way too important. The military establishment in Israel at this point, which was loyal to Joab, would have gone berserk if David had done something as precipitous as execute Joab. So he can't do that politically, but he can slap him in the face, and that's exactly what he's doing here. And of course, what we see in all of this is a somewhat doubtful strategy again. David being driven more by animosity, more by anger, bitterness, really than by sound judgment. All right. One commentator kind of putting a little ribbon on this part of the story so far says, it's difficult to explain David's appointment of Amasa on any grounds other than resentment over Joab's actions toward uh, Absalom. How could this win the loyalty of the men of Judah? This action could enrage Joab, confuse the loyal segments of the army, place the entire military authority in the hands of a man who had just proved himself to be incapable of command. David's personal pride here ravages public policy. So David, even though he means well, is being driven probably a little bit more by personal interest, by resentment, by bitterness, by anger, than by sound judgment. So that's where we are now. All right, well, David makes this appeal to the Judites, to his tribesmen. And they are so relieved that David isn't holding a grudge that he immediately hits his target probably more than he expected. So he swayed the hearts of all the men of Judah just as the heart of one man so that they sent this word to the king, return, you and all your servants. You see, uh, well, that's good news, but it actually was probably even more effective than David had expected or hoped. And the very fact that it wins such an immediate response creates its own set of problems, as we're going to see in a minute. So this immediately re immediate response here uh, causes David to return. Now, he's been in Mahanaim. I don't have a ready map at this point, but if you can imagine the Jordan River coming down the middle, there's the east side. I know you have to pretend I'm in a mirror here, but the east side, as I'm looking at the map, would be off to the east. And Mahanaim is a little town up to the north. And the fords of the Jordan are the place where the water is fairly shallow. So you can wade across, although it's not very pleasant to do so. That's how David had escaped with his men, with his family, with all of those who escaped from Jerusalem with him. They'd crossed the fords of the Jordan. So that's where David returns. He comes back to the fords of the Jordan. He comes back immediately, having received this invitation from Judah, but keep in mind, not yet having received anything from Israel. They've been talking about it, but haven't done anything. David should have waited, you see. He should have waited for an engraved invitation to come from the whole bunch, but it was sufficient. And this then actually precipitates another crisis, as we're going to see as we go along. So anyway, the king came, he returned to the Jordan. Judah came to Gilgal. Gilgal is a little uh, region right on the west side of the Jordan. So he's on the east side, he's about to cross over Gilgal's on the other side, and that's where the people of Judah, the men, the, the, the elders, the military and so on are going to meet him and greet him and bring him home. So they went to meet the king, escort him across the Jordan. So they're there to welcome him back, but this all happened so quickly, as I said, that Israel didn't have time to catch up. And so that's gonna create another little difficulty. Now. You may recall, if you were in the class, when David escaped from Jerusalem, there were two characters 
who both played prominently in the story of David leaving Jerusalem. One was named Shimei. Shimei was a Benjamite. Now, Benjamin was the tribe of Saul, who David had replaced. And Benjamin still had a pretty strong loyalty to the house of Saul. Even though David was now the king, you had people within Benjamin who resented David because, in a sense, David had deprived them of the prestige of being the tribe that had produced the ruling king in Israel. Probably the most dramatic expression of that resentment was this guy, Shimei. So when David is escaping from Jerusalem, here comes Shimei, a Benjamite from Bahurim, just a few miles from Jerusalem. Coming out looking like a whirling dervish, he's kicking up dirt, throwing rocks, turning the air blue, cursing David, telling David, you got what you deserve, you lousy scoundrel, get out of here, we never liked you anyway. This is Shimei. You know, if you were here in the class, you remember we tried to describe him. And uh, so there he is. Well, as it turns out, Shimei is at the wrong end of a very painful stick here, you know, because as it turns out, uh, his predictions that this was the end of David didn't work out quite the way he had anticipated. And so here he comes. He's one man, very critical to the story. The other one is Ziba. Two of them, both Benjamites, both of them with good reason to be a little resentful of David, even apart from this coup and all of that. Ziba was the servant of Mephibosheth. David had brought Mephibosheth, who was a grandson of Saul, into the king's court, give him a table, a place setting at the table, treated him like royalty, which all, we, we just love David for that, but Ziba didn't like David so much for that because Ziba, as the chief steward of the house of Saul, stood to inherit all that property if nobody else showed up to claim it. And nobody was showing up to claim it because they were all afraid of David, so Ziba all of a sudden lost this huge fortune when David restored it to Mephibosheth. So Ziba's got a problem because now here comes David home and he knows soon enough David's going to meet Mephibosheth. And here, the other side of the story, because Ziba had helped David escape from Jerusalem claiming that Mephibosheth had abandoned David, claiming that Mephibosheth thought the king would, was going to come back to Mephibosheth, all of which was utterly preposterous, slander, sold by Ziba to David, and at the time David needed Ziba's help so much he didn't have, he wasn't in a position to check it out or refuse the help that Ziba was offering. Ah, well, here comes a day of reckoning for both of these men. Shimei and Ziba both now show up trying to figure out how to deal with the situation at hand. All right, so Shimei had a thousand men with him. Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, and his 15 sons and his 20 servants had those with him. And they went over the Jordan before the king. Now again, the subtlety here is this. Shimei, even though he's a whack job, is a guy of some influence. He knows he is in big trouble. David had been unwilling to punish Shimei when David was escaping, even though he had a man willing to go and cut off his head, you know. But now Shimei knows it's a little different situation. And so Shimei is coming to plead for mercy, but by the way, he brings along a thousand men from Benjamin, <laughs> who are loyal to Benjamin, loyal to Shimei, and at least the implication, these are military types. Now, they're not about to start another war, but what Shimei wants to telegraph to David is, hey man, I'm going to plead for mercy, but by the way, I've got some cards to play here. If you will extend mercy to Shimei, then I can have some influence in bringing along with me 
the military power of Benjamin and bringing them once again into the fold. So don't lightly dismiss me, you know. So Shimei, even though he's in a ticklish situation, is nevertheless still smart enough to kind of play this poker game fairly astutely. That's why he brought the thousand guys with him. So Shimei's got this going on. Ziba also knows he's got a little bit of a painful predicament facing him. He shows up, he knows his mixed motives, he knows his slander of Mephibosheth is all going to come to light soon enough. And so he comes down and he wants to just roll out the red carpet. He's running a ferry service. When David was escaping, he had to wade across the fords of the Jordan, middle of the night, escaping with his life and all the little ones and the animals and so on with them. It was a tough go. Now, he's going to get the royal treatment, literally. There's going to be these nice barges that will ferry him back and forth, and Ziba is doing all of this because he also wants to look pretty good to David in the face of what is going to be an embarrassing moment for him. So he's running the ferry service, he and his servants and his sons and so on. Then a ferry boat went across to carry the king's household and to do what he thought good, probably back and forth many times. David is actually waiting till the end. He's sending others ahead of him. He's going to kind of make the royal entrance at a later time. So he's remaining behind for the time being. And it's in that setting, now, setting that we now encounter Shimei. What does he do? So here comes Shimei. Now Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was about to cross the Jordan. David's still staying behind. Then he said to the king, do not let my Lord impute iniquity to me or remember what wrong your servant did on the day that my Lord the King left Jerusalem, that the King should take it to heart. It's hard to say, I didn't really mean it, you know, if you'd been there, but he's doing the best he can. I, your servant, know that I have sinned. I get it. Here I am, the first to come today of all the house of Joseph to go down and meet my Lord the King. There's so much going on in this little speech. He's got his thousand men on the other side. That's one poker card he's playing. He is truly displaying a repentant attitude. And I think we can take that at face value. I think for whatever reason, maybe the influence of Ziba, who's also a Benjamite, and the two know each other, he is repentant. At least he's being publicly repentant for his outrageous behavior toward David earlier. But he also here, you notice at the end of this says, I've come today uh, representing all the house of Joseph. Well, now Joseph stands for the 10 tribes to the north. Ephraim was a son of Joseph, and sometimes that's the generic term for those tribes that were to the north. Benjamin was part of the 10, but they were in the southern region. That's why they could be there right off the bat. The rest of them hadn't showed up. So Shimei, in a sense, is apparently without authorization holding himself out as a representative not only of Benjamin and my thousand guys back here, but even of Joseph, of Ephraim. The tri in other words, he's doing everything he can to make it look like he's making an offer to David that David would be uh, foolish to refuse. This is politics on steroids. Do you see that? You know what's going on here? And so uh, that's really the play that Shimei is making. And David really doesn't have a whole lot of options. He was waiting to cross over, as we said. De uh, Shimei is, is you know, put his, putting his own welfare at risk, but he really doesn't have many choices. So he's there to make this offer. And as I say, holding himself out as a representative of Joseph. Well, Abishai is the son of Zeruiah, David's sister. Abishai is David's nephew, therefore, and Abishai is the younger brother of Joab. So you got the family tree. Abishai, I, I know this is a generalization that some of you won't appreciate, but Abishai is a typical younger brother, a troublemaker. You know, um, <clears throat> Joab was always kind of the leader of the pack, more responsible. I see somebody gasping over here, but you know, just ignore that. 
Uh, and Abishai, the younger brother, was a bit of a hothead, always on the edge. Way back when Abishai and David had gone into the camp of Saul, way back when David was on the run, Abishai wanted to take a spear and put it right through the heart of King Saul because he was sound asleep there in the middle of the camp. David said, hold the phone. No, 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 no. We will not lift our hands against the Lord's anointed. We're just going to steal a water pot, steal a spear, go off, make the point to Saul, I'm not trying to do you in. Would you please back off? You know, that's what David wanted. Abishai just wanted to kill him right there. Abishai, when Shimei had come out the first time, when David was escaping, had said, let me just go over and cut that guy's head off, Shimei. Let me just cut it off. David said, no, 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 Abishai. Come on, man. You know, God's probably ordered him to curse David. Ah, Lord knows I deserve it. And so once again, David, not going to go. Now Abishai, here he is again, being very typical. Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, answered and said, look, shall not Shimei be put to death? Because he cursed the Lord's anointed. See, he remembered what David said about the Lord's anointed at the time the Lord's anointed was Saul, so he figures, hey, now, now you're the Lord's anointed, so this guy deserves to die. Kind of simple logic that gets to off with his head, you know, in Abishai's thought. David said, oh man, what do I have to do with you? What business is this of yours? You son of Zeruiah, that you should be adversaries to me today. Do you think any man is going to be put in to death in Israel today? This is the last day David wants to put anyone to death. He, is, he feels like he's hanging by a thread anyway. He's grateful to be invited back. He didn't take that for granted. The, first, the last thing he's going to do is start chopping people's heads off. And yet, Abishai, that's exactly what he wants to do. Don't you think I know I'm king over Israel today? Barely king, but at least king. I'm not going to exacerbate the situation. I'm not going to aggravate these people. And so Abishai has to be put in his place. The word, by the way, for adversary here is the Hebrew word Satan, Satan. It becomes a proper name in the Old Testament for the one we know of as the devil, Satan. But it's actually just simply a noun in the Hebrew language that means an adversary or a prosecutor, which is part of the reason when Jesus was confronting Peter, and Peter took Jesus' side and said, you're not going to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the chief priests and elders and all that and be put to death. You know, that far be it from you, can't happen to you. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Uh, and it sounds very harsh, it is very harsh, but it really was saying, you're my adversary. You're trying to prevent me from doing the very reason I came into the world. You're, you're, and, and in a sense, Abishai is playing the same role here. He's playing this enemy. So, uh, one commentator put it bluntly, David had had enough of being bullied by Joab's little brother and responded as if saying, look, Joab I got to put up with, but not you. Don't you think I know today that I'm king over Israel? And that's very important, king over Israel. Not just Judah, who had invited him back, but even those who had not yet invited him back. Notice the last two sentences. Shall any man be put to death today in Israel? you see. For don't I know that today I'm the king over Israel? Even though there's been no formal invitation, in some ways I think David saw that by divine appointment, by God's appointment he was king. He hadn't been so sure of that not so long ago. When Absalom ran him out of town, David was willing to face the fact that maybe this was God himself rejecting David for what David had done with Bathsheba, and all of that. And so David at this point is very happy to understand that God himself is restoring it, not just the tribes of Israel, but even God in his own designs. So the king makes a promise to Shimei, you will not die. The king swore to him, you will not die. It was based partly on mercy, but also on political expediency. Shimei had a position to work from. He was doing it well. David saw it, and David was therefore not going to upset this very precarious political apple cart that was there in front of him. Shimei had backed the wrong horse, one said, 
but now served as the fence mender that David needed to help restore unity and peace in the kingdom. Um, well, David, by the way, kept his oath to Shimei throughout the rest of Shimei's, uh, throughout the rest of David's life. Um, the uh, rule I think that David adopted was what they used to say in the mob, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. He knew that Shimei was always a little bit of a nexus for more trouble. And he wanted to keep Shimei close, keep an eye on him. And even at the end of his life, he gave instructions to Solomon that Shimei deserved to die and that Solomon might want to go ahead and put him to death. But even Solomon carried on that policy. Shimei, we're going to keep you alive as long as you stay in Jerusalem. You stay under our watch. We don't want you becoming responsible for any new problems. So you stay around where we can see you for three years. Shimei obeyed that rule and then one day just for forgot. He went off chasing a runaway slave. Solomon had said, the day you leave Jerusalem is the day you die. The day he left Jerusalem was the day he died. You know? So he got what he deserved in the end, but not at the hands of, of, of David. And of course, the oath David made this day did not apply to Solomon. The subsequent ruler could do what he wanted in that regard. Okay, so that deals with Shimei and that part of the story. Now we come to this Mephibosheth situation. This is the narrator skipping ahead. So the scene we're looking at right now actually takes place a little bit later when David has come back to Jerusalem. The text here doesn't say it, but the next verse does. So I'll just let you know that. Now Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, actually the grandson of Saul, the son of Jonathan, but Hebraic expression would allow for this. Now Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. He had not cared for his feet, nor trimmed his mustache, nor washed his clothes. From the day the king departed until he returned in peace. So now we're skipping ahead. Mephibosheth is going to counter the story that had been told by Ziba. But bear in mind, Ziba had given David extremely helpful support when he was escaping from Jerusalem. So Ziba, even though he was in an embarrassing situation, also had a little bit of a position to work from because he had helped David out. So his hands are not entirely clean, but at the same time he thinks he can escape David's wrath for misrepresenting Mephibosheth in the incident that took place. Well, the proof of Mephibosheth's feeling toward David, his loyalty to David, was that he hadn't cared for his basic, uh, you know, personal uh, appearance and so on since the day David, he hadn't trimmed his toenails. I mean, that's bad, you know. He hadn't trimmed his mustache. He hadn't changed his clothes, that's worse. All of these were conspicuous signs of lament, of grief. And you could start the clock from the day David was driven out that Mephibosheth went into a state of lament, which, by the way, was risky for Mephibosheth because Mephibosheth was visible in the king's court. Absalom would certainly see this, and Absalom would know that Mephibosheth still supported David he was a cripple, he couldn't leave, he was stuck, but he was courageously making it clear he had no heart to support Absalom. David was his true king. So you see, here's Mephibosheth now coming before David. It puts David in a bit of an awkward dilemma because he owes something to, to Ziba. Ziba did help him out and he needed it. But of course he wants to be, you know, appropriate with Mephibosheth. So here goes. So it was when he come to Jerusalem to meet the king, the king said to Mephibosheth, hey man, why didn't you go with me? After all I did for you, how come you didn't support me? Mephibosheth answered, my lord, O king, my servant deceived me. I, Mephibosheth said, 
I'll saddle a donkey for myself that I may ride on it and go to the king because I'm lame. I needed help. I need to ride a donkey to get to you. Now, I think what we can gather happened here was that Mephibosheth learned that David was under attack and was escaping. Mephibosheth, the master of the house, gave orders to Ziba, his servant, saddle a donkey. Oh, and while you're at it, put together a whole lot of foodstuffs, a whole lot of things to help David and those who are with him as he's escaping. Let's do everything we can to be of support to David. Ziba obeyed, except for one little detail, he left Mephibosheth behind. Mephibosheth is helpless on his own, and so here comes Ziba, looking heroic. Actually acting at the command of Mephibosheth, Ziba shows up and says, here I am, your servant, and here's all of this for you. And what's David going to do? He needs that stuff. He appreciated it. He knew Ziba's story was preposterous on its face. Ziba had said, Mephibosheth thinks he's going to become the next king. Well, nobody thought that. Certainly not Mephibosheth, certainly not Absalom, certainly not David. Ziba knew better, but it was just this ridiculous, slanderous story. But in the moment, what could David do? See, he's not going to hold court right there and cross-examine the man. He needs the food. He needs the help. So he accepted it at face value. Mephibosheth continues. He has slandered your servant to my lord the king, but my lord the king is like the angel of God. So look, you do what is good in your eyes. All my father's house were but dead men before you intervened, is the sense of it. You set your servant, me, among those who sit at your own table. What right do I have to cry out anymore to the king? I don't have any position to, to complain here. The king said, look, don't talk to me anymore about this. I have said, the force of that is I've decided, here's what I'm going to do. You and Ziba divide the land. So David compromises it. He felt bound to do something for Ziba. He knew Ziba had really played him. He knew that Ziba had done Mephibosheth wrong. So he's going to divide the property between them. Now, there was a substantial amount of property at stake, so both of them turned out okay in the end. But it was a compromise. David probably didn't like it much, but in the situation, it was hard to do anything else. Mephibosheth, interestingly, responded and said, no, 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 let him take it. He can have all of it. Inasmuch as my lord the king has come back to peace, in peace, to his own house. Mephibosheth has a remarkable character of appreciating mercy. We can learn some things from Mephibosheth. He felt that everything he had received thus far was vastly more than he deserved, and he had no right to complain if every benefit were cut off right here today. He still, even under those circumstances, could only rejoice. And so, in a very remarkable way, he says, no, you know, Ziba can have it all. And I don't think it turned out that way, but that's what he was saying. Some cynical commentators have said, no, no, no. Mephibosheth was just displaying an adolescent attitude. You know what I'm saying? Oh, let him have it. Nah, I didn't want it anyway. Oh, that lousy property. For... No, no, no. No, no, that's not what's going on. I think the better comment is reflected here. Mephibosheth's appeal has all the marks of sincerity, but David is also under obligation to Ziba because of support offered and received. The sincerity of Mephibosheth is nowhere more clear than in his willing acceptance of an unjust decision. It's a good illustration of what Jesus had in mind in Luke 12, where Jesus warns against covetousness. Mephibosheth knew that a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So he's a great example. All right, now this looks like a long paragraph. I'm not going to comment on it in detail. I'm just going to read it. It's self-explanatory. It has to do with a guy by the name of Barzillai. Barzillai was an older fellow who lived in Gilead. He was also of the Transjordanic tribes, in other words, some of the ten tribes to the north, but he had also been a great support to David. When David had arrived in Mahanaim, Barzillai, 
who had some wealth, had provided food, provided beds, provided health care, provided all kinds of stuff to care for David, even though once again, you might not have expected him to be overly loyal to David, but nevertheless, he plays that role. So here's Barzillai the Gileadite, came down from Rogalim, his hometown. He went on with the king to the Jordan to escort him over the Jordan. Barzillai was a very aged man, 80 years old. Just a little side note here, if you don't mind, between our last Sunday school class and today, I turned 70 years old. And I want you to know that a very old man is anyone 10 years older than I am from this point on, you know? On an ongoing basis. On an ongoing basis, absolutely. So it's a moving target. So uh, anyway, uh, we had a great, by the way, a great celebration. My, my family that lived here, about 20 people came over, said some nice things. I told Candy after it was over, I felt like I just attended my own memorial service, you know? It was just, <laughs> it was so nice. So anyway, I, I think we should have memorial services earlier in the career of the people we're celebrating. I think that's a nice thing to do. But anyway, uh, here's Barzillai. He had provided the king with food while he stayed in Mahanaim, for he was a very wealthy man. The king said to Barzillai, Look, come with me, I'll provide for you in Jerusalem at my side. But Barzillai said to the king, look, I'm 80. How many years do I still have left that I should go with you? I'm 80 years old, can I still discern what's pleasant and what isn't? You know, do any of you identify with that? I don't know. Uh, can your servant taste what he eats or drinks? He may be a little over the top here. I don't. Can I still listen to the voice of singing men and women? Maybe a little hard of hearing. Why should I be added burden to my Lord the King? Your servant will go a little way, and then I'll go home. You don't need to recompense me. But then he goes on and adds this. Please let me return so that I can die in my own town near the graves of my mom and dad. But there, here's your servant Chimam. This is his son, son of Barzillai. Let him go over with my Lord the King to do for him whatever seems good to you. What you would have done for me, do for my son here. The king answered, Shemam will go over with me. I'll do for him what I would have done for you. All that you desire. Then the people crossed over, the king crossed over, the king kissed Barzillai, blessed him, returned to his own home, probably the last time he ever saw him. But at the end of his career, it specifically mentioned that David gave instruction to Solomon to be good to Shemam for the sake of Barzillai. And as a matter of fact, hundreds of years later, the prophet Jeremiah refers to the house of Chimam, which had become a known halfway point in the journey from Judah to Egypt. And many have speculated that Joseph and Mary, with the baby Jesus, might have stopped off as they were fleeing from Herod at the home of Chimam, hundreds of years later. So this blessing, of course, reverberated down for generations. That's why we should all take heart and plan for the blessings that are going to devolve to our grandkids and great-grandkids and great-grandkids, because some of them are going to be blessed, I tell you, because of you in this room, though they might never have heard of you. So it's a wonderful reminder of that. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip by this. Uh, a little bit more and we'll be done. The king went on to Gilgal, Chimam with, with him, all the people of Judah, and notice this, and half the people of Israel. The other half hadn't showed up yet, you see. Brought the king on his way. Judah had acted quickly. Shimei and Ziba had, of course, been there, closer at hand. They could, they could do what they did, as we just saw. But the rest of the tribes are still out there they haven't had time to show up yet. So the half is referring to those who are still out more or less to the north. Well, eventually they show up. Now, we don't know how much later, maybe it was in the same day, maybe it was two or three days later, I think probably it was a little more than just a few hours. Then they show up and came to the king and they're not feeling so happy. How come you didn't wait for us to extend an invitation? See, David was a little precipitous here. He probably should have waited. He was desperate to get home. He could have bided his time a little bit more. 
So here's what they say. These are the people of Israel. Why have our brethren, the men of Judah, stolen you away and brought the king, his household, and all David's men with him across the Jordan? How come we weren't invited? Sir? How many days were they contemplating? I don't know. I don't know. So, yeah, maybe. That's right. It could very well be. So, anyway, uh, the sense of it here is that, uh, is that you know, he had acted, and, and these people are now somewhat resentful of that. The men of Judah, before David could even answer this, pipe up. These are the men of Judah, and they say, because the king is a close relative of ours. Why, then, are you angry over this matter? And then get this, did we ever, have we ever eaten at the king's expense or has he given us any gifts? Now you gotta know the story of David to appreciate that little innuendo because Benjamin, the tribe from which Saul had come, had been uh, enriched by Saul at the expense of others and in a sense Saul had bribed them for their loyalty saying to them, I've made you guys wealthy. So how come you're not helping me out more? That was something Saul had done. So these, these guys from Judah are saying, look, we never were bribed to support David. We've had pure motives, unlike you guys. You see, there's this kind of insult inside of insult that's going on here. Well, the men of Israel answered and said, well, wait a minute, we've got 10 shares in the king. So we have more right to David than you do. Why are you despising us? Weren't we the first to advise bringing back the king? We were the first to think about it before you were. You can see what kind of... Yet the words of the men of Judah were more fierce than the words of the men of Israel. The ferocious response of Judah precipitated another almost revolt. A guy named Sheba tried to inspire a revolt. He didn't succeed, but the next chapter, we're not going to cover it, but you might want to go home and read it just because you're in the mood right now, you know, maybe to see what happens here. Uh, Sheba is eventually killed. Nothing comes of it. In the process, if you're interested, Joab winds up killing, stabbing Amasa. Just one after another, you know. So that's the end of Amasa. That little detail is wrapped up there. The bickering is so human. Judah claims blood connection, but Israel says, we have 10 shares of, shares of stock to your one. It happens again and again. Denominations claim special status, apostolic succession. You know, you hear that in Catholic circles. Divinely sanctioned form of government. You hear that in Presbyterian circles. I've said it myself. Purity of doctrine. Folks in the Reformed tradition tend to be proud of the purity of... These may well be evidence of, hear me, pride rather than faith. You know, isn't it true? Uh, how many times have people been, at, in an unhealthy way, proud of things that are otherwise good? It's just a dangerous predicament. Jesus gave glory not to divide, but to unite his people. But the glory can become a glowering, intended play on words there, across the selfishly drawn distinctions. The victory sours into vindictiveness. There's so many lessons in this uh, short story. I'm just going to highlight three very quickly and then we'll be finished. From David we learn that politics is generally no substitute for patience in the challenges of life that only God can resolve. We're all tempted toward politics, you know, and that's okay to be interested in politics. I'm not decrying that, but there is a place for simply quiet, patient, waiting for the Lord and his solution. I think David may have been a little precipitous here, and some of the complications that flow out in this story may have been a result of that. She may, we learn, that punishment is generally not necessary in the face of heartfelt repentance and genuine humility. The, the fundamental purpose of punishment is to bring about a state of repentance. If punishment simply makes a person angrier, it's not really doing the job. You know, we parents uh, and grandparents, of course, probably have learned that the hard way sometimes. The point of it, the point of discipline is to bring about repentance. She may here appear to be genuinely repentant, and that 
offset the need for punishment. Now I know sometimes crimes must be you know, cared for in terms of our criminal justice system and all that, I'm not commenting on that, but simply the fundamental idea, what's the purpose of discipline? Finally, from Mephibosheth we learn that gratefulness for blessings received always has far greater worth than grumpiness over benefits lost. All right, well, thank you so much. Let's, uh, let's close in prayer and we'll be dismissed. Our Father, we are grateful for the reality, the humanity of the story of the Bible. Not embellishing, but giving us the straight understanding of how your people have behaved both at their best and when it wasn't so good. We pray again that we would learn the lessons you have here for each of us that we would seek to model Christ in our lives, to be Christ to others, and that in that we would catch a glimpse of the glory that you have come down and shared with us. And we give you thanks for all of that in the name of Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm.